from the writings of Paul this morning. Not in the book of Romans, however. We will be in the book of Colossians, a much smaller book, four chapters, and uh, we will be looking at a portion of that this morning. This morning, we will examine why we must give thanks to God for His glorious grace. We will look at why we should give thanks to God for His glorious grace. Before we jump in here to the book of Colossians, I need a few words of, of introduction about the book of Colossians. Uh, maybe familiar with Paul, um, the author of, of Colossians, from um, hearing Pastor Matt as he preaches through the book of Romans. But it is important that we understand uh, the context of this book. They say context and say some inter introductory matters and matters of history. Some people may start to fade already and say, why is this important? This seems insignificant. Just preach. Just... But it is important for the understanding of God's Word that you understand what is going on in Colossians. Uh, two reasons, uh, and, and significant as you look at this, this context as you introduce here, is that in our jumbled world of religious thoughts and of deviant teachings concerning Christ and God's Word, we may be comforted that we are not the first ones to deal with jumbled religious thought in our day. We may at times be troubled by what is going on or what is new online or what somebody has just come out and disproved the scriptures or something new and heretical. And yet we are not the first ones in our day to deal with false teaching and with teaching that is in contrary to scripture. And this is the case in Colossians. And it's important to understand here that they, in this book, they also were dealing with deviant teaching. And so as you look at this setting, we may be comforted that this was a real book and a real place dealing with these issues. Um, as we look at the, the context also, we understand that this, we understand what happened then, that we may better understand the book, that it also may help us to better understand what it meant then and also what it means now. To understand what it means now, we must understand what it meant then. That's why the context, the history, is somewhat important. Um, as I mentioned, the author was, is Paul, inspired by God to write this letter. He wrote to the Colossians of Colossae. Um, it, the town was a very s a small town. Um, one commentator said it might have been the, the smallest group of people that, uh, that a church that a letter was written to. Um, uh, Colossae was a small town that had waned in its growth. It was about 120 miles east of Ephesus um, in, in modern day, near modern day Turkey. Um, it was on a trade route at one point, going north and south and east and west, and was, had a prominent place for a while along those trade routes, but eventually waned when a trade route changed. Um, two towns that were close to it were Hierapolis and Laodicea, that you may be familiar with in Scripture, that were written to in Revelation. And Paul writes to the Colossians, seems not having been there, but his concern is he's writing to deal with deviant teaching. If you look in, in chapter 2, verse 4, he writes, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you or deceive you with enticing words. In verse 8, he warns, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. He also warns in verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day of the, or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days. And then in verse 18, he again references this warning, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into these things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Paul is writing to these believers that are being, or that are in danger and being taught some dangerous teaching. The exact content we can pick up through these verses here, um, some with angels, some with ascetic uh, living, denying certain um, uh, bodily things. This, um, it seems that there was a mix 
of, of Jewish thought, but also of mystical thought there in that area of the world. So it's this synergistic idea, this combination of, of thought that he is dealing with. And Paul writes to deal with this deviant teaching and his solution to this problem is that Christ is sufficient. Christ is enough. Nothing else is needed. This, this false knowledge, this puffed up ideas that are being taught by this, this individual, he says it's foolishness. Christ is sufficient. He writes through this book some of the most glorious passages regarding our, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And in Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7, he explains this result of, of who Christ is and what Christ did. And he writes in, in verse 6 and 7 some key verses regarding what that means for Christians to do. And he writes in verse 6 and 7 of chapter 2, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught and abounding therein with thanksgiving. So the context of the book is Paul is writing to those that are dealing with deviant teaching and that Christ is sufficient. In the, in the first chapter, Paul begins with his, his greeting and he begins with two prayers. In verse 3 through 8, it is a prayer of, of thanksgiving for their, their um, salvation and the result in love, the resulting love. He continues the second prayer in verse 9. Um, through 14, that is a prayer for a desire for their further sanctification, for their further growth. And he makes two requests. The first in, in verse 9, I'll read verse 9. Uh, for this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He prays that they would know God's will. And not that they would just have this knowledge, but that this knowledge was purposeful. In verse 10, that they might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. That these people, he had desired for them to know God's will, that they would live a life that was completely pleasing to God. Well, what does a worthy walk, what does a pleasing walk look like? That sounds good. Live a life that's pleasing and honoring to God. Well, what does that look like? Well, he explains that in the next uh, few verses. In verse um, 10, he says in, in four participles through the next um, several verses that are underneath walking worthy. What does this look like? First, it is being fruitful in verse 10 in every good work. The second is increasing in the knowledge of God. Third, it is strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with, with joyfulness. And the fourth, which we will look at th this morning, is giving thanks unto the Father, which we have, he has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance in the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And it is this last manner of a worthy walk that we will look at this morning. That a, a God-pleasing, worthy walk involves giving God thanks for his glorious grace. Have you considered that living a pleasing life to God involves giving God thanks for what he has done because of his grace? We must give God thanks for His glorious grace. He continues in verse 12 through 14, and he gives three reasons. Well, why should we give God thanks? What is so glorious about His grace? Why should we give God thanks for this? Well, he gives three explanations, three reasons. Also, uh, th three participles underneath this, giving thanks unto the Father. Um, the first reason to give God thanks, he explains in verse 12. He says, referring to the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. First reason to give God thanks is that God qualifies inheritors. God qualifies inheritors. Um, in verse 12, um, he says, he has made us meet. The idea is qualified. 
He has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Um, partakers and inheritance, they have a very similar meaning there. Um, they are two different words, very similar. It has the idea of having a share of a share, or having a share of a portion, that they would be, um, that they would receive a portion that was allotted to them. Um, an inheritance is a good, good um, word there in, in the King James Bible that um, describes that lot or that portion that is there. Um, this inheritance, what is this? What does this look like? What, is, what does that mean? Well, it is the saint's inheritance, the inheritance of the saints. Um, p- p- the saints being possessive, that it belongs to, to them, that is their inheritance. Um, Beyond that, what does this mean? So it belongs to the saints, but what else does it involve? Um, this is it's not the grandmother's will. It's not simply the house as we think of and, and some of these trivial things, but it's what is being received. Well, in verse 1, verse 5, I believe there is a reference for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, that there is an inheritance in the hope of heaven throughout the New Testament. It talks about being inheritors of eternal life of the life which is to come. Um, In Romans 8, um, verse 17, he says that an aspect of an inheritance is future glory. It says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. And if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So there's an aspect of this inheritance in the future is that of future glory, of what will be received, this portion. Also in, in James chapter 2, verse 5, uh, inheritance is the kingdom, the future kingdom. He says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? So God is the one that qualifies Inheritors. He qualifies people to inherit this rich gift that is for the saints. It is an eternal life, future glory, a kingdom. The idea is being co-heirs with Christ. The riches and, and the fullness of being identified with Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And this is beyond imagine. The, the wealth and the, the, the goodness of God's grace that is available to those that are His and to those that are saints in what we possess in Jesus Christ. Great blessing and the riches of God awaiting is eternally rich in Jesus Christ. So we should give God thanks because God qualifies inheritors. In verse 13, the second reason is that God rescues prisoners. In verse 13, God rescues prisoners. Read the verse, he says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Delivered here is the idea of being rescued or being saved. Who, again, is referring to the Father. So the Father has delivered us from the power of darkness. So God rescues prisoners. The word for dominion of, of dar- d- darkness, or excuse me, the word power of darkness has the idea of dominion of darkness. It refers to authority, to right, um, or a sphere of authority. A ruler. The idea is that of, of here of angelic powers, fallen angelic powers. Um, this same word is used throughout Colossians as he deals with these People that are caught up with angels, in verse um, 116, the same word is used. Um, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. It's the same word there. All things were created by him and for him. Um, Chapter 2, verse 10, the same word is used uh, of powers, that he's the head of all principality and powers. That idea of, of dominion or those that are in, in authority in this, in this um, angelic, fallen angelic system, or in, in, in all angels in re- regardless. And in chapter 2, verse um, 15, it says that he has spoiled principality and powers. Again, these, do, this re- aspect of angelic dominion and, and rule. 
So what kind of authority is this? What is the, the power of, of darkness is what it is qualified as. That it is this reign of, of darkness. In Scripture, there is this contrast of, of light and darkness. We saw in verse 12, um, mentioned here, tie these two things together. But the inheritance that God qualifies us for is the inheritance of the saints in light. So there is this contrast in verse 12 between light and in verse 13, this darkness. The inheritance of the saints in light. The sphere of their uh, abode is in the light. It is in, on God's kingdom. It is in God and in righteousness versus this power of darkness, which is that of God's enemy, that of Satan, that of wickedness. So throughout Scripture, light and darkness are contrasted throughout Scripture. Light being, being God and His rule and truth, and darkness being that of Satan, that of His rule, and that of wickedness. Um, in 1 John 5.19, the, the rule of, of Satan, not that, is, that will ultimately be conquered through Jesus Christ and God in the end, but in the sense that He does... Rule In 1 John 5, 19, it says, And we know that we are of God, and that the whole world lieth in wickedness, or the wicked one. The, the sense that Satan is this, the God of this world, and not plural God as in the, the God and the ruler as in the one true God, but is a ruler. You see in Genesis 1, as he attacks God's work, in rebellion against God and, and brings his own work of messing up God's, God's work to institute his, his work and his, his rule and his, his dominion. Um, if you'll turn to 2 Corinthians 5, um, chapter 4, this contrast of light and darkness of Satan and God is also explained. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verse 3 through 6 it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light, again the light, of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Here it is again recognized that, that Satan is the God of this world, is, is a ruler in the angelic, fallen, demonic realm. His work is that he blinds, he conceals, and oppresses people lest they should come under the knowledge of God and lest they should learn of, of God and be delivered. We see God's work in revealing light out of darkness and the proclamation of light through the gospel and through Jesus Christ. We see this contrast of, of light and darkness here in 2 Corinthians 4. And again, if you'll turn in Acts chapter 26... Another clear contrast between light and darkness. Acts chapter 26, verse 18. This is Paul's defense before King Agrippa. Explaining God's purpose for Paul. And he explains his mission in verse 17, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom I now send thee, to open their eyes, the Gentiles' eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan, thus darkness, unto God, light, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Notice here our familiar word we've already seen. An inheritance among them who are sanctified, set apart by faith that is in me. So we see clearly this contrast between God and Satan, this domain of darkness, this rule of, of Satan in this world. Light for God and the, and the darkness of Satan's side. This passage is very similar to Colossians 1. 
Paul is, is, is there, his thoughts, his writing, and here as well being um, restated in, in very similar thoughts. Um, quickly for time, I'll read Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Considering the devil's domain and his rule. It says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself, referring to Christ, took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is, the devil. And deliver them, these people, children, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Here, Satan is the oppressor. Satan, the god of this world, that with his authority and with this, his, his rule, in this sense, over this world. Not an ultimate rule, but a rule nonetheless, oppresses those people that are in darkness, his subjects. They says fear of death, being in bondage. This is the, the work and rule of Satan. And not only is the domain of darkness, this, this realm of darkness, those rulers, Satan and his the demonic forces, but it is also those that are in darkness, those that are not in the light. In Ephesians 5.8, he says, Ye were sometimes darkness, but now you are light. Walk as children of light. There is this identity, there is this line in the sand between people, that you are either in light on God's side, in God's kingdom, or you are in darkness, in the rule of Satan. And it does not mean that, you, uh, that a person that is in dark, that is, that is in darkness, that is, in, in, um, it, it is lost and does not know Christ, it does not mean that they daily acknowledge that Satan is their Lord. It is not that they daily acknowledge their allegiance to Satan, but in their blindness, they are living in the rule of darkness subject to his, his rule and influence to this world and the world system. And in bondage and enslaved in their sin in this dark world. 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5 also says, You are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. These two realms are clearly distinguished through Scripture and here between the saints in light and then the power of darkness. And it is God who rescues. It is God who delivers from this domain of darkness. It is God who conquers and delivers people from the rule of Satan and his oppression, from his bondage. He, Satan does not love his subjects. Satan does not care for his subjects. Satan is a cruel taskmaster that desires bondage, his own glory, and the defeat of God's kingdom, which will not be. But Satan is a cruel Lord. Satan is a cruel ruler. And God is the one that rescues and delivers from the bondage of Satan. From Satan's evil and slaving kingdom. And God is to be praised for his, his work in delivering people from the bondage of Satan. The third, the third way in which God... Um, is to be praised is that God transfers his subjects in verse 13. That not only does God deliver from the power of darkness, from the dominion of darkness, he does not just take those that he saves out and leave them in a no man's land, leave them in somewhere in between on the line. No, there's only two places. We are in the light or in the darkness. And as he saves from the dominion of darkness, he transfers all those he rescues into the kingdom of his son, the kingdom of his beloved son, Jesus Christ. Transferred is the idea of, of translated or, or moving, bringing them into the kingdom of his son. Now the kingdom of Jesus, um, initiated at Christ's first coming, recognized in his subjects in the, in the current church, and is to be fully recognized when Christ returns, second coming, and installs his, his future kingdom. There's these two, the two aspects, on God's side or not. There is no middle ground. There is no middle ground. You're either under King Jesus, you're under his rule, or not. And under the bondage of Satan. There's two sides. There's no fence riding. Your loyalties and your citizenship are one way or the other. 
your, identif your identity, your position, and citizenship as a believer in Jesus Christ is in Christ's kingdom on God's side. We are a citizen of, he of heaven, a subject of King Jesus. So God transfers his subjects into the kingdom, into the rule of his own beloved son. And God is to be thanked and praised for this because he qualifies inheritors, he rescues prisoners, he transfers his subjects. But these questions beg, or these, these statements, these verses beg a question. Why? Why did we not qualify as inheritors? Why did, we not in, why did we not automatically inherit the riches of Christ? Why do we need to be rescued? Why are we under the bondage of Satan? Why is this the case? Why do we need to be translated into the kingdom of Jesus? Why are we not already there? This can be understood as we look here that it is God who qualifies us to be partakers of the inheritance. It is God who rescues us from the domain of darkness. It is God who translates us from or translates us into the kingdom of his son. It is an understood that we were not in this position originally. God is doing this work, meaning it was not already done. The cause for this previous position for this position of being a non-inheritor for being in bondage for being apart really the enemies of the kingdom of Christ and being a part of his of Satan's rule is explained in verse 14 through the remedy so through the remedy we also see the the cause we see the or the the damage and the reason is that of sin it says in verse 14 in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins the cause for not being for be, for not being an inheritor of the riches of Christ is because of sin. The cause of being under the bondage of Satan, under the dominion of darkness, is because of sin. The cause of being an enemy of the kingdom of Christ, the enemy of Christ, King Jesus, is because of sin. This is a universal cause, this is a universal symptom of, of, of sin that all possess. Is as in Romans, for all have sinned. There's none righteous, no, not one. And in Colossians, he explains what sin is, this breaking of God's law. He explains what would make us estranged from God and separate from God in this way. In Colossians chapter 3, in verse 5, he explains writing to those that are in the kingdom of light. He says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. He explains the, this filth, this, this things that are to be killed and put away. But he says, the explanation of sin, he says fornication. It is any sexual sin. Uncleanness or impurity, the idea of moral uncleanness. Chapter 3, verse 5, um, inordinate affection or passion, sexual, sexual passion. Evil concupiscence, evil lust and covetousness, which is greediness, which is idolatry. You know, in America, we don't worship, many do not worship idols, but we love our cars, we love houses, we love wealth, and greediness, which is idolatry. And in verse 8, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, slander of God, slander of man. Verse 9, lying. Also, filthy communication in verse 8. These are lists of, of some sins. Not, this is not an exhaustive list, but of sins that disqualify us from being in the light, from being inheriting God's, the riches of God, from being a part of Jesus' kingdom. It is, thing, it is sins and breaking of God's law with acts such as these that place us, that, why we are in darkness, because of we are sinners, and these the result of what we do in these sins. And these things are, not only are we not in the kingdom of God, but we are also under the wrath of God. We are under, we are in opposition to Him and under His wrath. In verse 6 of chapter 3, which things, for which things sake, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Well, I'm not in the kingdom of light. I'm not a part of Jesus' kingdom. So what? Big deal. 
I'm part, of our, I'm part of Satan's kingdom, whatever. I'm doing my own thing. I don't care about Christ, whatever. Well, in a part of being in darkness is that you're also under the judgment of God. You're in opposition to King Jesus and his kingdom, but you are also under certain wrath and the judgment of God for sin, which as a just God is an eternity in hell that will never cease. It may seem harsh, but you do not understand sin if you think it is harsh. Because that is the ugliness and the deadliness of sin. And God in His justice, in His righteousness, the declaration of judgment upon sin is, is His wrath, is His anger, is, is an eternity of hell. And to be in darkness is to be under the judgment of God. Which is a certain judgment. Because King Jesus will conquer, will win, Satan will be defeated, and those that are part of His kingdom will be punished as they're in darkness. Man naturally stands in opposition to God, deserving of God's wrath and His judgment. We have broken God's law. That in our country, as we break the laws of, of Salt Lake City or of the federal government, don't pay your taxes, you break the speed limit, there are natural consequences for that act of disobedience. And God is the ruler and king of this universe, and He has a law that is a perfect law. And breaking that law is deserving of God's wrath and His, and His judgment. So have you ever realized and considered that you are guilty or maybe are guilty before God because of your sin? Have you realized that before the King of the universe and King Jesus, that you stand guilty because of your sin? That is a weighty thought that each one of us have offended a holy God and are guilty. And it is this sin that is the cause for this position in darkness. Yet in spite of man's natural position, in opposition to God, this passage is one of thanks to God for His glorious grace. As we were talking about this morning. Discover grace. Grace Sunday. God's grace. That as the enemies of God, as being a part in opposition to God in darkness, God in His grace offers deliverance. God offers salvation to those in darkness. Though man stands unqualified, enslaved, and in an enmity against God because of sin, deliverance is available. And God is the one, and if you, if we, as we look here, God is the one that, that qualifies us, He delivers us, that transfers us. How does God do this? How does God accomplish this? How does He span this gulf and transfer His enemies that are in opposition to Him to being His loyal subjects in the light? How does God accomplish this? This is explained in verse 14 in Jesus Christ's work through the forgiveness of sins. In verse 14 we read, in whom, referring now to Jesus Christ the Son, in verse 13, the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins, forgiveness is the idea of a pardon. The idea of the sin debt being canceled, deleted. It is no longer, it is obsolete. This deliverance and, and this transferal to the kingdom of God is not one that we may earn and do upon our own. We have a burden and a debt that cannot be removed on our own effort or our own works. There is nothing that we may do that will eliminate the burden and cause of our darkness of sin. We are helpless. We are helplessly in bondage, in fear of death. And it is only God who will rescue and only God who can save through Jesus Christ. Sin is the cause and sin is the needed cure. You go to church. You give. You help. People on the, the corner, you give. You're, you're, you're kind. You are a good citizen. Your goodness will not exclude your, your wickedness and your sin before God. Sin is what is needed to be cured and is the cause. And the solution to sin is, if, is its removal. And is removed through redemption in Jesus Christ. Um, here, redemption, it says, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Um, redemption, 
um, stands in uh, simple apposition um, to forgiveness of sins. And its idea is that they are complementary ideas. They're not the same thing, but they are complementary and they are similar in, the, in their relationship. And redemption is the work of Christ in providing the forgiveness of sins. How does God, a just God, forgive those who have offended him? As a holy judge, how does he forgive those that are guilty? He does that through redemption. Redemption is the, is the picture of a slave market, of God paying, or of a person buying a slave, paying a penalty, or paying for and purchasing, paying a price for a slave. And this is the picture in contrast to these, these verses is that God is rescuing from darkness. He is, he is spanning this gulf and redeems. He purchases us out of darkness through the work of Jesus Christ. He rescues, He saves by purchasing and by buying in redemption that is through Jesus Christ. Now this paying, this redemption, this paying of a price, this is not to the ruler of the God of this world. It is not a payment to, to Satan. Satan does not collect the blood of Jesus Christ. Satan is not the one who is paid with the work that Jesus paid. It is a picture here that Jesus pays the price and that is the extent of the illustration of redemption. Is he pays the price. The recipient is, is left un. Determined. It left. Uh, it, it is the illustration ends ends there. This redemption, this paying of the price, is very costly, and it is through in verse fourteen through His blood that Christ receive, redeems sinners by His blood through His blood. It is his, through His sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary. Um, this is further explained um, in verse twenty. He has made peace through the blood of his cross. In chapter 2, verse 14, he explains he's blotted out the handwriting of ordinances, those things which we are guilty for, that was against us, which is contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The work of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, burial and resurrection. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 also states, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed, you were not bought with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, from darkness in essence, received by tradition from your fathers. But you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That the cost for God to take his enemies and to make them his loyal subjects, to give them an inheritance, was the death of his beloved son, which he loved dearly and sent because he loved us, because of his grace, because of his goodness to us that we did not deserve. Christ's death was satisfactory because he was God. He is the king, and we see through this, this hymn, verse 15 to 19, that in verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the manifestation of, of Jehovah. He is the firstborn, not of origin, not in creation, not in his, his, his being in created. He was not created, he's eternal, but in superiority. Verse 16, by him were all things created. He is the creator, Jehovah. He is eternal. In verse 17, he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is eternal. He is the sustainer of everything. Verse 18, He is the preeminent one, which is reserved through scriptures for only the one true God, Jehovah, who is Jesus Christ. God the, he is one with God the Father. One God and yet two persons in, the myst in, in God, in the mystery of, uh, of God. Verse 19, He is... Um, for it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell, that He is the totality of God. Jesus Christ is God. And it is through Jesus Christ's death and His perfect sacrifice that we saw in 1 Peter that this redemption is possible. That Jesus, who is God and man, verse 22, it says, in the body of His flesh, that this Jesus, who was man and God, perfect God, 
perfect man, 100% God, 100% man, provided the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He never committed any one of the sins that we listed in thought, word, deed, anything. He was the perfect lamb. And through Jesus Christ, we have redemption. He died a sacrificial death on behalf of his enemies. He was buried and rose again. He triumphed over demonic forces. Verse 15, spoiled principalities and powers, making a show of them openly. And he provided forgiveness, this pardon of sins, through his work of redemption. How is one transferred from darkness to light? It is only through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. It is only through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Christ has provided the forgiveness of sins through his sacrificial death. Do you possess this forgiveness? What is the status of your sin? before a holy God. Have you been redeemed by Jesus Christ? What side do you stand on? Are you in light? Are you in darkness? Are you under God's wrath or under God's blessing? This forgiveness of sins is through Jesus Christ, His death, and is available only through faith. Colossians 2.12 explains that we are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him, Jesus, from the dead. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 and 6, as we read earlier. In verse 6, God who has commanded the light to shine out of darkness, this message of Jesus Christ and his work has shined in our hearts to to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And it is the God of this world, in verse 4, who has blinded the minds, which the, the minds of them which believe not. Belief in Jesus Christ is how we may possess the forgiveness of sins. It is only through what He has done in His sufficient work. Um, Acts 26, as we also read, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that we may receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me, that by faith that is in Jesus Christ. John 12, 46. Jesus is the light of the world. Whosoever believes on him shall not abide in darkness. So this morning, as, as Acts stated, will you turn from darkness? A choice is, is before you this morning of, of epic proportions, of eternal significance. If you are not in the kingdom of light, will you turn from your sin and turn from darkness to Jesus Christ? Will you this day believe on Jesus Christ to be saved from your sins and have your sins forgiven? Will you believe that He is God who died, was buried, and rose again and paid the penalty for your sins? Will you turn to Jesus Christ in faith to be rescued from your, the wrath and from darkness? Through the redemption of Christ, God qualified us to be rich inheritors. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and he translated us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Christian, believer, saint, the same people, those in the light, we have much to be thankful for. We did not deserve the forgiveness of sins through Christ's redemptive work. We did not deserve to be qualified to be inheritors of the inheritance that God has provided, of the riches of Christ, we did not qualify. We did not deserve to be rescued from bondage. We did not deserve to be a part of Christ's kingdom. This was a work of God's grace. Because we were His enemies, and yet God loved us, and He sent His own beloved Son to pay this penalty for us. So may we diligently live a life, a God-pleasing life, as believers, by expressing thanks to God for His glorious grace in salvation. 
And this morning, if you are in darkness, if you have not trusted in Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior in His work on the cross, this morning is, is the morning. Obey God's command to repent and, and turn to Christ to be delivered from sin and from wrath. Father, we thank you for your word. We, with humble hearts, lift up thanks to you for your great work in redemption, Lord, in qualifying us for an inheritance, Lord, for delivering us from the bondage of sin in this, in this world and of the devil. We thank you for translating us in the kingdom of your Son. God, we are ever grateful and thankful for your grace and pray that you would be honored and glorified. This morning we pray in Jesus' name.